Welcome everybody to the big picture with Amazing Dyslexic Salon. I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Gil Gershoni and I'm founder and creative director of Gershoni Creative Agency and Dyslexic Design Thinking in the US, San Francisco and Dallas. At Gershoni, we work with clients from all over the world to help them build their brands, launch their products and tell their stories. Today, I'm so excited to be here with you to talk about my dyslexia and my story and other uh, amazing dyslexic from this brand new book, The Big Picture of Amazing Dyslexic and the Job They Do by Kat, Kathy and Kate. Let's bring Kathy and Kate on. Hi, guys. Hello. How are you? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Gil. So we're really looking forward to hearing what um, Holly, Guy and Dom have to say about dyslexia and their relationship with it. When we planned today's salon, we noticed that although these amazing dyslexics work in different fields, these entrepreneurs have created more than just businesses. They've created communities. Our first guest, Holly, champions a devoted community of creative businesses. She initiates social media campaigns like the recent one, Flying the Flag for Small Business, and inspires us with her Conversations of Inspiration podcast. Holly speaks from the heart and says it like it is, and has been particularly amazing during this last year, cheering on all those independents during really tough lockdowns. She's waded through government literature so we don't have to, and in plain English, shared what grants and support are available. Our next guest, Dom, has created a thriver maker community in East London by turning part of his huge industrial estate into beautifully designed spaces for other like-minded makers and artisans. And Guy, he's built up a loyal community who share his values on organic, sustainable fruit, veg and meat. Each week, this community looks forward to Guy's news in their veg boxes, a great recipe and an essay about sustainability, or a rant about an ethical farming issue that he feels strongly about. Riverford staff love him too. A few years ago, Guy sold three quarters of his company shares to them, confident that by them having an interest in the company themselves, it would make it better for everyone, growers, staff, customers, and the planet. A little more background on Guy. He's taken Riverford from being him and his wheelbarrow delivering homegrown organic veg to his friends to a national box scheme delivering to over 50,000 customers a week. He also writes cookbooks and a blog called Wicked Leaks. Guy has had some serious fun getting to this point. He studied agriculture at Oxford University and was a management consultant in London and New York but is much happier in the field than in the boardroom. Tell us about the others, Kathy. Oh, thanks, Kate. So let me just say we've got Holly Tucker in the house with us today. Holly Tucker, MBE, founder of Not On The High Street and Holly & Co, is the UK ambassador to creative small businesses. She believes that following your passion and building a business doing what you love is the key to a happy and fulfilled life. Through Holly & Co, Holly is working to positively influence this creative movement by redefining what it means to be a small business, encouraging more women to start their own businesses, as well as empowering our young with the skills to thrive in the new working world they are entering. Through her podcast, events, um, a physical shop, and now a number one business book, Do What You Love, Love What You Do. Navigating life as a dyslexic, Holly never had the confidence to write, and throughout her career, the task of putting pen to paper was a daunting prospect and required much preparation and double and triple checking from others. It was only when her co-founders at Holly & Co encouraged her to put pen to paper that Holly began to write a daily blog on Instagram and so began her next adventure. Holly believes that dyslexia is her superpower and is the reason that her mind approaches everything with creativity and colour, a trait that has defined her work ever since. Our next amazing dyslexic is Don Wilder. Sorry, too many words, but they are worth the intros. Don Wilder is an entrepreneur who puts creativity at the core of everything he does. He has, he has set up two successful design businesses since graduating from the RCA in 2002 and seeing a finished object still gives him goosebumps. Don knew he was dyslexic from an early age and fell in love with woodwork in the CDT workshop at school. After graduating, Don set up a Wilder Creative, an architectural bespoke furniture company where he 
manufactures digitally using CNC te technology to produce the majority of his furniture. This coupled with traditional carpentry techniques produces really beautiful work. In 2008, Dom co-founded Facet Homes, an architectural practice which revolutionized the way houses are put together. Their concept is eco, low-cost and extremely fast construction, was demonstrated on Channel 4's Grand Designs Expo, where they built their house in two days live on TV. In 2014, they went on to win Best New Family Home at the Evening Standard Awards. Dom admits, the best bit about running and owning his own business is that he has a forklift truck and a workshop full of machinery he likes to call his Lego box. So over to you, Gil, and what are you most likely loving to hear tonight? Well, you know, each one of these guests are just so uh, uh, influencing in their community and what they're doing and bringing people together. And I know as dyslexics, uh, it can be a really big challenge. So I'm so excited to hear about how they overcame their own uh, dyslexia and how they opened up and basically brought a lot of people in their community together and changed their lives and their careers. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing all about that. What about you guys? What are you looking uh, to hear about today? Um, just how they've built communities. I mean, they're all very different, but they have um, they have built their communities in their own right with Holly and her devoted followers, and Dom awesome. creating this amazing, beautiful you know unit of, of, of a beautiful cafe and ceramicist, mm -hmm. and of course, guy who who has given part of his company to all his employees. I mean, that's it feeds the world. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Well, all of you out there, uh, welcome, welcome. We're so happy that you're here from all over the world. I see a lot of chatter going on. Please add some questions to the chat for our guests. If you like what you see today, please help us raise our content to the top by subscribing to our YouTube channel. And of course, hashtag Amazing Dyslexic with any takeaway. With that said, let's bring our amazing guests on. Hey, guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Holly, Dom, great to see you guys. Great to see you. How's everybody doing? Good, really good. Very well. Oh, so lovely to see you guys. Um, Dom, let's start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what is dyslexia means to you in a word or so? Well, hi, I'm Dom. Um, gosh, dyslexia. Dyslexia is a thing that sits above and around you at all times, but you have to find ways to navigate around it. Um, I think that I think that listening to the introductions, it's it sits so close to my heart that you have two other people that are in totally different sectors that have gone through very very similar experiences to myself, and I think this whole thing about having a community is so critical because you need that support structure. There's a Absolutely. there's a thing about dyslexia that can make you feel really isolated. You know, you're you're in this place where you just don't feel good enough and you think, well, why am I not good enough? And why can I not do these things? Um, I was lucky enough um, to be diagnosed. I don't think it should be called a diagnosis, really. It's just a difference. Um, but I, I was told and, uh, about being dyslexic <coughs> late primary school, uh, early secondary school. And, you know, I had, I had tests and I had to have psychological um, um, you know, IQ tests at various stages of my early education, and that helped. But what I found frustrating was that the education system just didn't know how to adapt. It didn't know how to kind of embody this difference um, and and allow the dyslexic students to to be able to do their learning in a different way. I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that. From that isolation school, you, as you grow up and you become, you know, your your own boss, let's say, you real you find tools and mechanisms to have people around you that can really support you and know that your vision and what you're trying to do is the goal. Mm -hmm. And all yeah. those other bits that you find hard, they can support you. Absolutely, absolutely. And that support is so important to uh, your own identity and building the community, as we're going to talk about today. Hi, Guy. Hi, Gil. How's it going? Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. What does dyslexia mean to you in a word? Uh, well, I think the word would have to be outsider. You know, I, th I think it contributed to a feeling that I was an outsider, that, I, you know, the world wasn't quite like for me like it was for everybody else. I mean, I might have felt like that anyway, but I do think dyslexia was, was part of it. And how you, how, you, how, it, how you deal with it, I think, depends very much on your confidence. And um, I don't know, I was sort of blessed with 
almost, I think, a kind of arrogance, really, that I wasn't going to let it hold me back. I mean, there was, I didn't know I was dyslexic. I didn't, I wasn't aware that there was a word for it when I was young. But, you know, I tried to write from right to left and I still can't spell to save my life and all the P's and B's and all that sort of thing. You know, my kids ask me to read them bedtime stories. <laughs> so, um, so um, but yeah, I mean, and, and that leads to a feeling of isolation, as Dom said, and, and uh, you know, and you, you, you find your way in a different way. But I mean, I, I, I am aware that it could so easily have crushed me, uh, you know, if I'd yeah. gone to a different school. I went to a fantastic um, state primary school where they, oh. they just, it wasn't really until I was 11 and I got to secondary that I really realised, you know, how different it was and what a prob problem it potentially was. So, um, you know, that was helpful. And, you know, I grew up on a farm where I was, you know, probably like Dom, you know, loving making things and machinery. And, you know, I learned to weld when I was about seven, I think. And so I was doing all that sort of stuff. It didn't really matter about, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I know that a lot of us out there do feel the isolation, but uh, talking about it and bringing ourselves together and uh, sharing, I think it's definitely the first step for, for a lot of the young uh, folks that are listening today as well. Uh, how's it going, Holly? So lovely to see you. Very nice to see you too. Thank you for having me here. Of course, of course. Tell me, uh, what is this lecture to you? Um, I suppose... I. I, I, I'm a slightly different to Guy in terms of that I found dyslexia, um, the word that I would use is exciting um, mm. because actually I think that I just wouldn't be who I am today without it. Um, I feel like dyslexia gave me a route um, in life that was the path less traveled and it allowed me to work a muscle that I don't think I would have worked um, if I hadn't have been dyslexic. And that muscle was about connecting, connecting with people. Um, I do think that we have a bit of a superpower that we're able to get under the skin of people because we've had to read people for so long. We've had to um, maybe see things that other people don't see because we've had to find a new way of communicating. And um, and we're you know full of imposter syndrome, all these sorts of things. So for me, it's led to exciting um, an exciting world where I've built business um, through what I feel that I've learned through being dyslexic, reading people, understanding people, connecting with people, um, and that's now what I do. You know, my full time job is basically connecting with people. Um, and my community is my full-time job. So, um, you know, it, it's something that's actually very positive in my life, even though it's been, you know, blinking difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can relate to the exciting part. I mean, it wasn't the first my first word, but as I got older and kind of realized yeah. the power of dyslexia and how, as you said, reading people, seeing things, understanding um, non-linear situation. It's such a strength of dyslexics that I think uh, it's really, my word would be really a hyper ability as I learned to sort of hone it, you know? Um, Dom? I, de I definitely don't. Think, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's a disability. I think I may have given that impression. I, I really don't think. It only becomes a disability if it affects your confidence. I think, yes. you know, that that I, I can imagine within a more conventional educational system, it must be, quite hard to to avoid that and i certainly appreciate that you know with okay so i can't write well you know and i can't spell but i can you do a lot of other things. Well, though. you do like <laughs> with, the, with the help with the, okay i mean actually just the words come out differently yeah. but you know word processors were just changed my life so but mm. the, the um you know i can see things those connections which holly yes. you know mentioned for me i'm guessing it may be more like dom it tends to be more you know physical connections you know, I can design things in my head and, mm. and reach conclusions that just take people. I mean, I sit in meetings talking about that. I'm so bored by how slow <laughs> it is. You know, they may be able to swept spell, but my God, they're slow when they're making those connections. And, you know, it, it, I can end up either falling asleep or being quite rude because because they are so. So, you know, we're all, we're all different, aren't they? You know, it, it's interesting that it comes out in different ways because. You know, I'm definitely not good at the sort of people angle of it, which it seems sounds like 
how it's come out with Holly. For me, it's much more to do with shapes and physical things that I feel mm -hmm. my superpower, as Gil calls it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a very good point. And it's really about confidence. I mean, Michelle was saying it does affect her little boy's uh, confidence. And uh, we'll talk more about it uh, throughout the show, about how do you find your spark and how you find your sort of uh, gift, which I'm looking forward to getting to. Uh, Dom, how can we use dyslexia in a unique way to, to help uh, uh, create community? How do you do that in your world with your uh, team and clients and collaborators? Um, well, I think it's. I think the, the, the creation of community is it, it, it kind of happens naturally for for dyslexics because it's like I was saying earlier on about you you feel like you need a team of people around you and also I mean from a creative perspective I've always wanted you know there is that imposter syndrome that you have so the more can people you have that are like minded to you and you can discuss and share ideas is really I think really important um, that kind of feeling of isolation when you're at school thinking that I've just got this computer and I've got to send stuff out on this computer and that's the only thing is terrifying. But having a group of people around you where you can say, well, look, do you think that's right or is this good? And, and, I, and I've always, been, it's almost like when I first went to art school, I, 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 did, a, I did a BA in um, fine art and sculpture and it was just coming from, from secondary school, I, I did a foundation year and that was just amazing that you could just make stuff and you, you, you know, that's all you had to do occasional little essay at the end but getting to getting to the the um, degree course and just being given a space in a studio a workshop next door and say make whatever you want was just the most amazing thing and wow. having all those other artists around you that are in the same kind of shoes you're going well is this good art is it bad art is, do i enjoy this is it, you know you, you you question so many things about yourself over that three-year period um and and I loved it. I, I really loved that sense of community then. And I think I've carried that throughout. It's a bit like I didn't really want it to stop. So, and <laughs> I, my first job, I, I went to my tutor and I said, I, I think I don't really want to be a sculptor in a shed on my own, chiseling a little bit of marble. I know that, but what I, what I want to be, I don't know. And, uh, and so he said to me, well, look, they're gonna they're gonna start a design course on uh, you know new course next year. Why don't you you know see if you can get a job as a technician with them? So I went to the dean of the department and said, "Can I be the te te technician?" And I, he, he, I had to go through the whole interview process, which was terrifying himself, and write a little thing. But I, eventually, I got the job. So I went from student to teaching staff, you know, six weeks after graduating, which was comforting in one way but terrifying in the other. But it was. Just wonderful to suddenly be around another group of people. I had to kind of teach them, uh, but I was learning at, at the same time. So it was a the knock on from that was once I graduated from the RCA several years later, I kind of did the same thing. I set up that same little community where I had a workshop. I knew I couldn't afford a workshop all my all on my own. So two or three friends from the Royal College said, "Let's get a space in East London," and then, and we found this amazing building, and we just thought, right, let let's share the workshop, we'll have the rest of the space, we'll get some desks made up and we'll rent out desks. I mean, it was literally the first WeWork. And, you know, we had rented desks, people could share the workshop, and, and that was the beginning of that community. And it's, it's, um, it just grew, it was lovely. Yeah, yeah. I can very much relate to your story, you know, as we, we tend as dyslexia, we tend to actually reinvent, right, and create our own, our own, uh, our own spaces and bring people around so because you know we don't fit to the linear sort of structure you know and uh um holly i know that you do this uh in in, in so many different ways how do you bring people into a community uh tell us a little about you know how does that work for you and how dyslexia helps that happen yeah i mean i think dyslexia helps it happen for what i said earlier because i'm um I'm a, I have become a people person. Um, so I can't, you know, the things that I can't do, I can do when it comes to people. And so you, and very much, um, you know, what you were just saying about you invent your own ways. And I suppose right. that has led me to um, love being an entrepreneur. And that's what I do. And I build um, what other people don't see. I build connection and community. So my first business, not on the high street. Um, now I look back, you know, this is 16 years on, but now I look back 
basically I was bringing together a whole heap of people who didn't sort of fit in. Um, they all were small businesses, they were making their own products and uh, they'd been kicked off the high street or they weren't on the high street. And actually they were the sort of the um, underdogs. And actually that's, some people ask me, you know, what is that thing? Why are you obsessed with small businesses? And maybe it's because that's what I felt. You know, I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I wasn't um, going to ever fit in. And actually, so what I did was then realize I wanted to find a way of connecting all those people together. And um, and that's what I did with Not On The High Street, you know, connected 5,000 small businesses um, who, you know, I haven't done a poll, but I, I will uh, bet that a, a large amount of these um, wonderful people are dyslexic just like my podcast, Conversations of Inspiration, um, where I had the pleasure of interviewing Guy. You know, it was unbelievable how many successful entrepreneurs are dyslexic. Um, and and thanks, now, what, thanks for asking that question. Keep asking it because it's so interesting for um, you know, everyone to know. And this is what we need to do, just get the message out there. So you're doing a great job with that. Yeah, well, what? Sorry, I missed the first bit you just said. Well, the fact you're asking that question to everybody is brilliant. Yes, absolutely. Because it, quite frankly, um, I have children. I have my business, Holly & Co. And one aspect of it is we have a physical space. And these children come in and maybe their mothers have told the kids that I am dyslexic. And I, it's one of my greatest pleasures to talk about, tell me why it's your superpower. And so you giving them some language to use around it and um, being highly proud and open and honest about it. And I think that that's what we have got to, got to do. It's why I actually think your book was absolutely phenomenal um, because it is, you know, it was a way of really opening up and the amount of kids and teenagers I know personally that have that book, um, it's created the conversation at home. And um, it's just, yeah, it was fantastic. Mm. I do feel like there's a bit of a tide at the moment, I must say, uh, you know, in terms of, I've always kind of been proud of being able to say I'm dyslexic, but I feel like it's even easier in the last probably five or maybe seven years. It's I think the tide is switching where people are starting, the, the wider community, not the dyslexics, are starting to think, yeah, you know, there is definitely a superpower there. There is, there is something different and there is, there, is a, there is a place to encourage and a place to explore how, and I hope, that education structures can change to accommodate that. I mean, my, I've got a 13 year old son and he, I was always questioning whether he was going to be dyslexic and I would say, where he's not, I was a little bit disappointed. Um, but as, uh, a, father, a father friend of mine, um, his son was very dyslexic, and you know, this, the this, the primary school just didn't have the facilities to really, you know, encourage him. Um, and and that was that was very sad to think that you've got to find another institution to to really bring out the best in in children. Um, but I do, I'm, I'm hoping that it is changing. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I really hope that this is a move towards us just appreciating diversity, you know, and, mm. um, you know, we talk about dyslexia, and, you know, it's fantastic that Greta Thunberg is making a, a, a strength out of her autism, you know, and, that, you know, and, and, and which was viewed as being, you know, just 100% negative and pretty badly negative, yeah. certainly, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, I, I employed you know, well, I work with two people who are really quite autistic and, you know, within a team, you know, God, I wouldn't leave, want to leave them, leave them to make important decisions uh, on their own. But as part of a team, they, 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 they really contribute and are absolutely fantastic at some things. Um, no. So, yeah, I, you know, it is that just appreciation of diversity, whether it is, you know, most obviously, you know, I guess, uh, gender and race but you know i think it extends to lots of other things as well and if we can appreciate that we'll all live richer lives absolutely well yeah. said well said what what role guy what role do you play in you so many in so many communities and and, and projects and businesses you're involved in what role do you play in that how do you see um, all yeah no that? i've been interesting listening to you all on this because actually i think i'm pretty crap at it. <laughs> i mean i i kind of i've done what i've 
you know, being an outsider, I suppose, because I haven't fitted into other communities. I haven't liked the way that businesses are run. I haven't liked the way that my neighbours have farmed. And I have, I suppose, I've never really felt part of the communities that I've founded, perhaps. <laughs> you know, I started a cooperative 25 years ago. I say I started it because that is really the truth. You know, 10 farmers came together, but I dragged them together and... Uh, <laughs> pretty much dictated and and two years after it started they voted me off because <laughs> i was so bad at kind of collaborating and, and in some ways i feel you know with riverford after 30 years i haven't left and and i don't think anyone wants me to leave customers staff or or co-owners or suppliers but i have kind of left i've gone moved up to a farm two miles up the valley where i'm starting doing my own thing again you know and um so I don't really feel that I, I'm I, it's something that I don't massively like about myself. I would much rather be sort of part of the team. But so I, I, I think I have quite a different perspective on it to the rest of. Uh, and I was just going to say, do team. you come at it from a different perspective? Do you think that's what's made it successful in a way? Yeah, no, definitely. And and I really value community. I you know I I, I just think doing things together, you know, is. You know, uh, I always, when I sign our books, I always sign it, you know, guys saying what's in Stronger Together or Together We Can Change the World. Together is written yeah. into the founding articles of Riverford. Uh, so it's not that I don't value it. I'm just not very good at it, you know. <laughs> so I don't, uh, you know, and, and I, in many ways, I admire the people who are, and I have recognised that as a weakness, I suppose, and surrounded myself which I think in business you have to do, recognise what you're, well, probably in everything, you know, what you're not so good at and try and find other people who can, you know, fill in the gaps that you leave. And and, and I've been lucky to find those people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it sounds that, um, you know, good or not, it sounds that your success and ability to see those 40 farmers, drag them together, create other businesses is the ability of dyslexia. You can see non-related things and bring them together and, help them thrive. And Definitely. I know that, uh, I know that, you know, as, and as you said before, guy, you know, it takes all of us and it's really about the diverse diversity and uh, different types of thinking that makes it work. Right. If it was only a group of dyslexic, if it was only, only a group of non-dyslexic, but together we're able to make it work for each other. So uh, yeah. see the big picture and um, yeah. And I think in the history of an organization, there are um, stages at which different, character traits are more important so if a founder says getting it going you know being very innovative being able to quickly see those connections and so on though that's something that i was definitely very good at you know as it matures and you need more kind of completer finishers who, who are more interested in who are probably more patient in their approach and they're better at improvement rather than you know initiation you know that's when i step aside because i've got the attention span of a flea and, and let someone else, you know, do do that. And, you know, so I just think it's important to recognise, well, I say it again, recognise what you're good at and to appreciate that we all bring different things. So it's that kind of diversity thing again. Yeah, and you're yeah. all very, very passionate about what you do as well, aren't you? All of you. Yeah, completely. I think, I think you have to have that passion. And uh, I was just listening to Guy then. It's interesting about, I mean, I don't think... <laughs> As much as I'd love to be able to step aside and let everybody take over, I don't think I could. However, <laughs> it's interesting because the, the, the attention span thing is really, really interesting, and I think it's something that um, it, it can really, it can really affect younger kids that have dyslexia. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I, my 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 part, business partner here, she's constantly saying, "Don where are you? Come back! We've got to do this. We've got to finish this pricing. We've got to do this." And I'm off talking to one of the carpenters about something completely random. Or, you know, over a weekend, I'll have a different idea and I'll come in on Monday and go, what about this? And she's like, can we just focus on what we're doing? And it's like, she's, she's Lexi, she's called, she's, um, she's like my voice of reason. And I'm kind of the visionary of, let's do this, let's do that. And she just kind of brings me back down and says, right, let's, this is what we're focusing on. And even down to this building we've got here, this building is it's 30. 5,000 square foot of factory space and I, came, I I was looking for a new space and I drove past it and I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I took photos of it and I went down and I said, look at this, this mate. And she's like, are you nuts? And we only need 6,000 square foot. Why would we take a, a building the size of a college? And I just 
had this idea. And I thought, no, it's going to be great. And, um, and, you know, we pushed, we spoke to the people that owned it. And, you know, we had this whole concept of creating this community and sub subletting out all the different spaces. And now it's just a thriving, thriving space. We've got ceramics workshops upstairs. We've got a sourdough bakery. We've got our own little cafe and we've got our, our space where we do the, fact, the, the, the furniture. And it's, it's like, it, it's another one of those kind of things where you're always thinking about the next thing or how can I do this over there? And I think if anything, I'd probably be more successful if I just focused on one thing, but I don't think that's gonna happen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of our uh, one of our guests uh, is asking is, uh, have you guys felt vulnerable due to your dyslexia? And I know a lot of dyslexic um, feel or, or, or have the uh, imposter syndrome, you know. So, Holly, how do you work around those feelings to connect with others? How do you work with that vulnerability and find your um, your spark? Yeah, it's an interesting one. You know, we've been talking a lot about um, imposter syndrome with International Women's Day and it being quite a female trait. Um, I am not the greatest fan of this word, I have to say. I don't, I think uh, an imposter means that you're not welcome, you shouldn't be there. And a syndrome, again, um, you know, as we've just been speaking, I don't like this sort of idea that, um, like Dom says, it's sort of, you know, you get diagnosed or it's a syndrome. I, I just think these words just aren't very helpful. And we've got to remember that really what imposter syndrome means is, I think, a momentary lack of knowledge. You know, it's, you know, you, the imposter syndrome, it's not like you are you and then there's this other parallel version, Stephen Hawkins sort of string theory, you know, that sits here and actually that's really the real you. And you have this sort of tussle between the two of you, you know, who's the real you? Well, you are just you. <clears throat> you have these days where you do know a lot about some information. Um, and I feel like the imposter syndrome is that space in between um sort of you knowing what you're talking about and um, and not knowing necessarily what you're talking about and so i really feel that we have to start to reframe all of this and it's something that i talked to my young about as well which is that um i don't have imposter syndrome right now um that's a weak a weak spot for me or i'm super excited to learn about that that's something i've not tackled before now aren't you brilliant at it could you help me or um i can't i'm excited um to understand this and i think we've got to start to reframe from this sort of i've got imposter syndrome somehow i'm um you know it's going to follow me forever you know this is a syndrome that i now have in in everything that i do to actually just pinpointing this is an area that i need to work on and i think that we can especially i don't know about um necessarily men but from what i've worked with female founders um we can label ourselves with things and so i i think that the imposter syndrome is something it's great that we say it and that we you know, acknowledge it but i do think that there is just what it really is is just that in-betweenness between what you are and who you know and what you smash um brilliant your your that's what you do you know i do small businesses but if i go into another situation and someone talks let's say i, I talked about you know guy farming you know i there is nothing I know about farming. You know, do I have imposter syndrome or do I just have a lack of knowledge in something? And um, and so I think that that's a really important distinction, um, especially for women to stop labeling ourselves necessarily. Yeah. There's but been a great thread running through the chat, which I just noticed while listening there about doing stuff defiantly. I love that, you know, I mean, yeah, that is, you know, I'm not an imposter, I'm being defiant. Uh, you know, I think that's yes. a great way of, of, of looking at it. Yeah. yeah. But, or is it I just that? The imposter system, I, I was, I, I heard that. Sorry, carry go ahead, on. Dom. Sorry, say again? No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just, the imposter syndrome, when I, when I heard that expression, I really, I actually, I know, I know what you're saying, Holly, but I think I, I, I was really relieved to kind of have a tag. Like, okay, I'm an imposter. That is actually describes how I feel. And I've mm. tracked it back to just having confidence shattered at a really young age. You know, so you just, 
I mean, I remember my geography teacher telling me that there's just no point me doing the exam because I wasn't going to pass. So just, you know, kind of go home. And, 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 and those, those, those vital years where you are told that you're not good enough and you know that you are, it causes such a conflict. And that's when you're, when you're presented in the professional world, you, you, you've still got that behind you thinking, am I not good enough? You know, am I not? Uh, and that's where I think the imposter syndrome comes from. And actually, once I heard that expression, I was like, yeah, that's, that describes how I feel. I don't think I'm an imposter anymore. In fact, I'm an expert. And I've started celebrating the fact that I'm an expert in certain things, and I'm not good at other things. And it's okay to not be good at other things, which is why you build structures and frameworks around you to, to deliver what you need. It's this whole, I saw some stuff in the feed about right brain, you know, education systems need to start recognizing their right brain people and their left brain people, and they take in information and they give out information in different ways. I mean, that's computers right. have transformed the ability to be able to communicate because that's what it's about, being able to communicate. If you can't read, you can't get the information in. And if you can't write, you can't get the information out. It doesn't mean you don't know. And that, I feel, in later life is what gives you that imposter syndrome. I shouldn't be here because I'm not good enough. And that's truly wrong. And, and you're right, it, shouldn't be, it certainly shouldn't be a syndrome. Yeah, yeah. well said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can, I can relate. I went to five secondary schools, and each one of them was so similar. You know, I traveled. We moved to Scotland when I was young, and so I went from. I went actually. I went from a state school, which was horrific. I was very lucky to spend two years in a specialist dyslexic school. Um, it was called Brickwall House at the time in Northern. It's now called Renfrew House, and still specialises in dyslexic teaching. And that was a really amazing period of my life. Uh, and then I went. We moved to Scotland, and that was a whole world of change and uh, and that's where a lot of a lot of uh, anxiety occurred you know because they, they they just didn't didn't want to even enter the conversation of dyslexia so anyway yeah yeah i i, I um uh, you know i can relate to those feelings and i know a lot of people in the chat are sort of uh, resonates with them as well is that it's something that seems so basic right that you can't do and the rest of your peers if it's at work or, or if it's at school can do um, and obviously dyslexics, uh, it's not an IQ thing. It's just that you, it's hard to see the linear story because we always want to see the, the three dimensional uh, of it all. Um, one of the things that I know that Holly, you were talking about is how do you find your spark? How do you find your, um, your, your, how do you find what is in you that you can shine the light on that? Would you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a hard one to describe, I must say, but it is probably, if I have to think about my consistent golden thread in my world, my businesses, it's exactly that. It is um, finding your unique diamond. And it's, it's I, I believe that, you know, when we think about that we have what is it, one in 400 trillion chances of being born. Um, on my 40th birthday, I worked out that um, on our, we have roughly 29,000 days on this planet. And actually on my 40th birthday, I'd actually only got 14,000 days left. With that knowledge, knowing I was highly unique to be here in the first place, but time was running out, you know, I knew inside of me what my diamond was what my uniqueness was um i did it when i was 20 you know this is what you get with maybe age um and i realized that i had a, a superpower of connecting connecting with people reading people um and empowering and in inspiring them that's just my diamond and i always talk to small businesses i get asked a lot about you know what should they start how can they start and i and i talk to them about what is their diamond you know if we all have to have peacock feathers you know just one thing what is your peacock feather moment you know what is it that is so unique about you that not one single other human could ever be the same as you about and um and we all have it, by the way. There, there, there is not one person watching, listening that doesn't have it. Um, and actually what entrepreneurship is, in a way, is finding your diamond and amplifying and commercializing your diamond, uh, building communities around your diamond. And it's a really lovely thing to think about if you haven't ever thought about this or that notion, what is your diamond? And how are you going to nurture it? How are you going to polish it? 
mine it, shine it, and then basically, you know, shine it against uh, out there in your community. Um, and, you know, I suppose I'm just like a chief miner now. All I do is just go searching for people's diamonds and, uh, and it's an absolute pleasure. Oh, yeah. Oh, so beautiful. How lucky are you? I, yeah, uh, I'm very lucky. You know, it's like you, you're sitting with all these amazing individuals and organization and finding what they, who, who, who they are and how help them see it and amplify it. And I know that we do the same thing in our business. You know, it's, you always want to find that thing that often we overlook it because we're sitting right on it and we can't tell that that's my shine or that's my, as you said so beautifully, your feathers. But when you find it, you take it for granted. And then when you find it and you find a way to tell that story and sh shine a light on it. Uh, more of what it is versus what it's not, then really that's what a transformation can occur. And I think that is such a beautiful way you describe it. And uh, and I think also for young for young uh, uh, for young adults for young children, it's so often the discord is around what you cannot do. And I think really moving the conversation to what you can do all of a sudden become that superpower, that uh, confidence that can be built over time. Um, and um, you know, we all talked about the right brain and the left brain, and I think that that is, we all we all have it, and it's something that can really change the the educational framework and bring those those strengths and gifts to the forefront. Um, what kind of things do you do, Dom, working with your team to sort of find their strengths and differences and sort of amplify that for for your team and organization? Um, well, I mean, we have a team of creatives here, so um, but. Through that door there, there's there's a, a huge workshop with all sorts of machinery and and stuff like that. And what I've what I've learned is when you're building a team, it, it, it's sometimes not just about how good a person is, but it's about how they feel about doing something for you. And I think that's the most important thing. As you know, I can't do all of the stuff that needs to be done here. I have a vision for what it needs to be and I design stuff and we, we detail things for other people and so on. But ultimately, I need a team of people to be able to do these things for me, just like you know, finding someone to help you with an email. But in, in, in the, the making side of stuff as well, you find incredibly creative people, carpenters to all sorts. And, and I think when you've got all these creatives around in a room, you realize that there's a huge sensitivity to the creative mind. And, and it's a, it needs to be nurtured. You know, it's it's my job not just to, you know, wander around seeing that things are being done right or proper, but it's also to encourage each individual. Even if you've got a fifty-year-old carpenter that's been doing all his life, he still needs to know that you know what he's been, what he's making is really beautiful. And I think it's it's about, you know, you're a boss. But the like someone said to me the other day, the only person that cares about the boss or being the boss is the boss. Actually, the people in everybody else just wants to feel valued by you and by the people they're working with. And I think that's a really a really important part of my job is just to make sure that on the floor everybody is everybody's enjoying what they're doing. You know, we spend all this time in, in, in work. And for me it's really important that the people that are coming to here to work really want to be here. It's not just a job, it's about being being part of something we're trying to we're trying to improve we're trying to innovate we're, we're trying to experiment and there's you know it's it's you know it could be strange territory it's not like we've got one product which we're just stamping out all the time it's like everything everything we do is a prototype or it's something unique or very bespoke stuff and so there's a challenge there i think it's just making sure the team feel that they're they're as much part of that journey as as i am yeah it's so interesting what you're saying about labeling. I mean, we talked a lot about it today, about different labels from the imposter syndrome to your role to being a boss, a CEO, um, and, and finding your, your light. And I so agree with you is that when we remove those labels and we just relate to each other as people and we can see each other's sort of strength and our differences and work together, well, with your work, it's so beautiful. You can really see how those um, outcomes shine, you know, and... Uh, and really, you know, my grandmother used to say that when you sew a pillow uh, and you, you stitch the inside of the pillow with the same craft and with the same details, the outside, the pillow would tend to glow. And I think that's really true about the sort of person too, right? That when you look at, at those things and you feel that inside, then you really be able to shine around. Um, 
Guy, you know, uh, what seeds can we plant now in order to grow a stronger community in the future? And, and uh, you know, physically as well as conceptually, uh, I would love to hear your take on that. You're asking the wrong person, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, can I come back to your uh, the uh, the labels thing? I've been kind of musing on that a little bit and, and listening. To absolutely, the, uh, absolutely. Uh, it, um, you know, I'd love to live in a world without labels. Uh, you know, uh, you know where we didn't, you know, classify ourselves by our, our gender, sexuality, whether we're dyslexic, autistic, whatever. You know, age. You know, but. We seem to need them. I, you know, in some ways, I think it gives the oppressed minorities a sort of identity with which they can maybe have some strength and fight back. It, it, but mostly, uh, you know, and I, that can be a good thing. Mostly, I think it's a kind of laziness. I mean, we we we, we encounter so many people every day that we we have to adopt these kind of shorthands. Um, which perhaps help us to typify people into sort of groups. But, you know, you get put in a box and a pigeonhole and, it, you know, it can be really frustrating being in that box and people having decided who you are because you've got that label. And I, I, I'd love to live in a world without that, you know. And um, so I think it's great that we support ourselves as dyslexic and identify that it's, you know, it's not a disability. You know, it definitely can be a superpower, but I don't want to be defined by that. Right. Right. It's, it's very fair. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I, dyslexia didn't happen to me. I, I was born with it. And uh, as like any other skill and any other talent, embracing it sort of allows you to own it and, and, and to let it sort of thrive. So I hear you loud and clear. And I guess that. maybe it helps us learn from other people as we are this evening, actually, you know, that learn yeah. how you can deal with it and, you know, and enjoy the benefits of it and perhaps, you know, cope with the downsides and, uh, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I suppose I'm just, I, I, I have some discomfort I, with it, I guess. Yeah, but I, I think it's important to change this negative connotation. You know, we have, yeah, we've yeah. met this wonderful, charismatic, cool, funny, warm, open <laughs> bunch yeah. of people. They're all here. <laughs> but, but, but we didn't have a bad experience meeting anyone. And, and I guess probably you're the same, that you can almost curate your people, can't you? Um, you know, I mean, Holly, you do with the, the companies that you work with. Maybe it's sort of to do with small businesses and independence and people not are more passionate when it's their own business or when they are part of this business rather than just being part of the corporate machine. Um, I don't know, but I think it's just we just got to be proud of being who we are and not go back to the root of insecurity of what you were making at school. I think that's the thing with this one, Guy. I completely agree with you in terms of labels and having a labelless society. And I think there's a lot of labels being thrown around at the moment. Um, however, I think with dyslexia, what I was saying earlier on is that it's at a tipping point. You know, it's, it, it's converging from negative to positive. And I think that's really important for the community of people that have gone through that suffering. I'm reading the, the feed of all these people that are really frustrated and, re and, and actually yeah. discovery of being dyslexic and the positivities that we're trying to give out is really, really good support for, the, for those people. Yeah. And so I think, I think that's, that's absolutely fair, Dom. And, yeah. and I think my, you know, I was blessed for some reason it didn't hold me back and it didn't affect my confidence. But, you know, I really feel for those, you know, for, and I could so easily see how it could crush, you know, people. And, yeah, you know, I think it is. To support, help them avoid that, then we should. Yeah, and it's no. a ce celebration of, you know, it's a celebration of difference rather than just, you know, looking at a, a label, if you like. Yeah, yeah. I'll settle for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you guys have any uh, uh, tips or any to sort of tools or methods that you use that you learn over the years that helps you uh, relate and and connect to your community? I know that. Uh, a lot of people are sort of trying to figure it out, both in the workplace, within their sort of interest in community. Any tips or guidance that you can share? Holly, well, do you have any thoughts? Well, yeah, I, I just saw that Louise Allen just asked about how to organize um, the business day as a dyslexic. Um, I've been always one to, I mean, I, you know, 
in my career, I've been surrounded by very many left side of the brain people, as you can imagine, and I would drive them absolutely nuts with my right side of the brain uh, way of dealing with business. Um, one of the things, Louise, I found um, to be brilliant is something called Trello. Um, and actually, it is a visual to-do list, um, ultimately. And so for me, being more right side of the brain, um, dyslexia, et cetera, et cetera, I like images. So actually, my to-do list is basically based image based and you can just move things around and it's super super easy um i actually built holly and co on it um we run everything every project is um based on that the other thing is is that you know what holly and co is trying to do is really take the you know the bullshit out of business um and actually redefine how we speak about business you know for too long it's been run by um you know it's been quite alpha and what I'm trying to do is bring color to gray and so I think that what's very important as a dyslexic you can have fun with things I mean actually just the way our brains work we just instantly do things our way so you know I would have you know rooms that were completely whiteboard mag magnetic so that I could, everything was post-it notes, everything was cut out pictures. Um, do you know what I mean? It was all visual and, and very often it was never in a computer screen. And that was the way that I worked. And funny enough, even though everyone threw their toys out for pram when I suggested it, um, my goodness, everyone loved it because it was a way of coming together, talking, moving things, being dynamic and coming, you know. And I think that that's what, actually dyslexia can give you is a way of bringing things out of the computer screen out to the world because you're using words and it's a far because you're finding it easier but actually what i found is everybody finds it easier um and so th those are my things and, and also giving things great names do you know what i mean like not conforming you know your pnl doesn't need to be called a pnl um you know we call it pears um we call it peaches and lemons you know it's very very sweet with the peaches when we make money and it's frigging bitter when you don't so um you know just have fun with things because actually i think that that is the confidence that you can get as being a dyslexic you think differently and just own the way that you think mm. i i i think that that not trying to be linear you're kind of forced on a page to be linear top to bottom you know left to right start on the page anywhere you like i mean write any word you want make a picture and and I, I never make notes when I'm in a meeting like that. I, I'll just write a couple of words, and I'll maybe I'll ring them, and I'll maybe connect them, and whatever. And and that that works. And I can remember when I was studying. Actually, I used to lay it all out on my bedroom floor and have little bits and pieces. I never worked in the in a conventional yes. way. And that that's you know. So you know. Anyway, that that's yeah. That's what that's what what worked for me. And 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 you know, really, yeah. Not try and do the conventional. You know. God, I mean, trying to absorb information from a, a from text, I, you know. Well, I, I suspect that most people find it really hard. I find it absolutely impossible. It's 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 just a useless way of getting things across. I mean, I have you know PowerPoint. Oh my God! I mean, really. I mean, I, I use PowerPoint, but I only ever show photographs. Uh, and when I had to try and convey to you know, which I happen to think what we do is very beautiful, so people always like that. Uh, and when I was trying to convey to uh, staff, now co-owners, my how I wanted the business to be run, I did it not through, I, I did it actually through, I, I, I got all this cardboard from the pack house and I drew silly pictures on it and I had ropes and, and hoes and hammers, which were my sort of prompts. And, and, and I stood up in front of them and they all thought I was completely mad. And they're, they're, they're kind of virtually, well, they were virtually in a museum when we finished it because it refined it through very, and then the cleaner threw them all out, <laughs> which was a shame, all those beautiful pictures. But yeah, yeah, so I think to adopt, you know, and it wakes people up. You know, the idea that you can present them with all this text and they're just going to absorb it. I mean, my God, if they absorb 5% of it, you know, yeah. looking at profit and loss, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, an accountant may have the sort of mind that can absorb information like that, but I don't think many of us have, and and I don't think you know most of the general population work like that either. Yeah. Yeah, I love the. I wish I wish you had it or a picture of it because I would love to see it, and I bet you your your team and your organization would never forget uh, uh, that presentation. And I think that's really what it's about, like thinking about 
uh, uh, how to shed the light of the way we do it, to play, to draw on the wall, like Holly was saying, you know, in our agency, everything is, is physical. Even when we work on the computer, we do research, we print the images, we cut them up, we put them on the wall because we're able to see uh, uh, through them, and which is what dyslexia people can do. And we use the strings to connect them. And, and then all of a sudden you're in a surrounded room on all four walls and you're in the center of the thought and the idea. And that is so inspiring. Uh, obviously to me, that's how I see, but to the rest of the team, uh, I just galvanize their play and, and brings their strengths. Uh, <laughs> Is that, uh, that, was, that, was, that was perfect soundtrack to uh, to that inspiration. Um, Dom, any any uh, uh, as as we start to get to the top of the hour, Dom, any other thoughts, any other tools or tips that you use with your team and your community to sort of bring everybody together and and help your dyslexia? Talk. We just talk. You know, I mean, I don't have meetings. We occasionally will have a production meeting, but you know, I find sitting down having a production meeting and trying to say, well, what's what's actually you know. Right, we've got to get everything out the door, you know. And we work with big contractors that have got building sites in the center of London and they want deadlines, right? They want, you know, you get penalized if you don't have a deadline. And I'm just like, well, look, this stuff is so precious, right? You've got to you've got to give it time. And I say to these big contractors, it'll be done when it's done. I mean, it's it, it's still precious, <laughs> but trying to bring that whole anxiety, right? That anxiety of deadlines into a business where you've got all these creative people just doesn't work. They just like you can't say to a some a craftsperson hurry up because it just doesn't work. So we just talk it out and, you know, we, we make excuses to our stakeholders and say, well, look, you know, if you, we make beautiful stuff and it takes time. So definitely talking and communication. The communication is the most important thing. And the best way of doing that for me is is, is talking and drawing. I mean, when I, whenever I'm having a meeting, I, I communicate with drawings. I don't write stuff down, I draw pictures, mm -hmm. you know, and then, <laughs> I've been in these meetings with people with notepads and they're, they're writing the whole time, all these notes, especially architects, they're brilliant at it. And they really nice <laughs> handwriting. And it's like, beautiful. Oh, you know, I just have it in my head and I've got a few stick men or something, you know, and maybe a picture of a window because we're talking about windows. I don't know. And then I put that back and I know exactly what the whole meeting was about. I don't need to write this right. Stuff. And then they send it in minutes. Then they send you an email with it all in, in text. And I'm like, <laughs> my life is too short to have to do that. So yeah. just don't do, what, don't do what you don't want to do. Just do yeah. what you really love and what you're good at. And that's that's what I, I mean, it's worked for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you guys have a similar things, but because I don't take notes that way, I just learn how to like immensely listen to your point, you know, and really try to hear and be in the present in the moment. And I tend to just remember it. You know, maybe it was just because I was always compensating because I wasn't as skilled at it and I didn't want to sort of, put it out there, but um, I, I really developed this sort of keen sense of trying to listen not only to the words, but the body language and the dynamic in the room and really seeing that. And as a dyslexic, at least for me, I found that I can kind of uh, get more out of the situation than versus going to the notepad and writing and kind of losing a little bit, not being really in the present, just sort of listen to the ideas, you know? So. Uh, um, well, I know we're at the top of the hour, so I just want to give you each one, you know, if there was one thing that you were to say to your younger self uh, um, to help through this uh, transition and this challenging time, what would it be? Holly, let's start with you. <laughs> um, it would be that basically I'm enough. You know, that I am absolutely enough. Um, dyslexia and everything and that it's yeah that that's you know everything I used to think was I was never enough um, and now I realize that absolutely you know it was a gift and I am um, and that's what I try and impart with every child that I meet you know um, that, that you know that they are enough and to find their diamond oh, yeah. I mean, can I say the same thing but in a slightly different way absolutely yeah. If it sounds like bullshit, it probably is. That's, yeah. that's always served me well. Yeah. So, you know, if it really, it doesn't work for you, then, you know, reject it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Dom, any last thoughts? So what, what I would say to my younger self, um, probably you have no idea how much machinery you're going to have later on. <laughs> and just be excited about it. <laughs> big big tool big big toys i love it i love it <laughs> machines I love machines. robotic machines brilliant 
Yeah. Well, this was so inspiring. I, I, I want to thank you all so much for uh, um, sharing your thoughts and, and, and sharing your, you know, how you go about building communities and your successes. Um, I want to thank all the audience. Kim, Kathy, um, you are, you know, the muse to this dyslexia community and bringing all of us together with this amazing, amazing book. If you guys out there haven't got your hands on it, please grab it. There's so many great stories of people in all over different industries making things happen and playing with their big toys. And um, if you love what you heard here today, please help us raise our content to the top by subscribing to our channel. And uh, you know, our next event, which we're so excited, is coming up on May 20th, where we're going to be challenging the narrative uh, through dyslexia, really rethinking about how we're using dyslexia in the creative way to rethink the name, to rethink uh, uh, the, the paradigm and bring a new perspective to it. So please join us on May 20th at 10 a.m. U.S. and 6 p.m. London. And uh, we can't wait to see you all. And thanks again. Any uh, last words, Kim, Kathy, before we uh, part? Oh, just a, a massive thank you. We knew it was going to be a good one tonight, so you didn't disappoint. Thanks yeah. for your time <laughs> and for, for join, yeah. joining us. We love you. We love you. And we want to thank help you. you. Thanks, Thanks for bringing us together. Thanks, Gil. Kathy. Thank you very thank you, much. Everybody. Thank you. John, Bye. John when, you, when you want to be indispensable, I want to talk to you. When you really decided you want to, I'll help you. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. 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 To talk to you both um, off stream and just you know Holly, I think what you've done is incredible and uh, you know reading your 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 section of the book, guy, I think it's a uh, what an amazing thing you've done. So uh, yeah, humble to be in your company. Yeah, not just the from Riverside. I can't clap because I got a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky. <laughs> I'll have one. Enjoy it, enjoy it. And, and thanks to Gil for hosting. And um, Thank you, Gil. my pleasure, absolutely, that's absolutely. Backstage team, too. Yeah. And all the dyslexics out there. <laughs> <laughs> Be defiant. Yeah. Absolutely. Shine the light. Yeah. Bye, bye. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. 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 Mm-hmm.